The clock says that it is half past ten, so it is time to start. I'm Stephen Anderson. I'm the executive director of the Academy, and uh, I'm delighted that we are able to put on this two-day conference on open access. It sold out um, a little while ago at 140 delegates uh, for each of these two days, such as being the level of interest. And people have spoken about this conference as the seminal event uh, on open access. And um, from the program of speakers and the topics, a range of topics and issues that will be covered, it is clear that we are trying to be as comprehensive um, as possible in teasing out uh, many of the issues and we have, I'm delighted to say, a distinguished and knowledgeable and influential uh, group of speakers uh, to lead our discussions in doing that. This conference would not have been possible uh, without the support from three publishers, Taylor and Francis, Sage and Wiley. Um, representatives are here today and uh, senior representatives will be speaking tomorrow. Uh, their wares are displayed uh, around the room here. Um, there's plenty of stuff, if you like collecting stuff, um, there's plenty of stuff to look at and take away, and I'm encouraged to ask you to do that. The program for the day you'll find in the packs on your sheets. Um, the Wi-Fi access code is also listed towards the top of the program for those uh, who feel the need to be online um, whilst the conference is taking place, you'll see the access code listed there. If you're attending for two days, as most of you are, um, could you please bring your uh, conference pack and program with you uh, tomorrow? Also in the pack are evaluation forms. Uh, we would be grateful if you could spare a few moments to complete them um, either at the end of today or the end of tomorrow. Now, a word or two about some of the domestics here. Um, as uh, one or two of you have already discovered, um, the toilet capacity in this building is not huge. Um, consequently, uh, there are toilets both at the entrance uh, where you came in uh, and also behind me through, through the door on my right-hand side, but the capacity is not huge. And if 140 of you all decide to go to the toilet at once, there will be a considerable queue. So um, if you were able to um, stagger uh, your <laughs> usage, uh, that you might find that helpful or anticipate um, a coming need to use one. Uh, could I ask you if you would very kindly put your mobiles to silent? Um, and I've also been asked by uh, the refreshments um, the people who are serving those, those of you who have brought cups with you upstairs, could you please return them uh, during the coffee break? We have um, a photographer, uh, David Simmons, who is circulating. Uh, because of the level of lighting here, um, he will need to take flash photography. We do want to make a record of this event. If you have... Um, any difficulty personally about uh, appearing in a photograph um, or concerned um, that uh, you have a good side and a bad side and potentially um, David might have taken your bad side um, and are concerned about that, have a word with me. But I'm proceeding on the basis um, that certainly the speakers and the rest of you who will appear mostly in what I call crowd scenes um, will um, be content to be photograph photographed. The um, outputs of this uh, conference will appear as rapidly as possible on the Academy website. So the individual presentations, a report of uh, this conference uh, will appear on the website uh, early next week. And then um, the engrossment of the presentations and the report uh, will actually be coming together as a engrossed uh, briefing paper, and that will be available as soon as we can get it uh, printed. 
Um, you've noticed that there is um, a video also being run, um, and uh, the video uh, will appear on YouTube, um, apparently, and, um, uh, and hopefully you will be able to view it. I was, I was um, at a university last week, uh, road showing for the Campaign for Social Science, um, and we tried to connect to uh, YouTube, and the university abandoned it. Um, so, but hopefully you will be able to, um, it, it will not be prohibited, and you will be able to um, see, see, the, see yourself again on YouTube. Our chair um, is Professor Dame Janet Finch. She has uh, told me that she has rationed her appearances um, at conferences and events such as this very uh, tightly because she's been asked to uh, speak and appear at all manner and sorts of events. Um, we're delighted that she has uh, been prepared to come and share today's session, but I'm afraid she's not here yet. Um, she's actually stuck uh, on a train somewhere between, I think, between Manchester and Euston. Um, she is on her way. Um, the, uh, the, the text to me um, say that she's moving again, um, so I hope that she will be here shortly. It therefore remains for me uh, to introduce our first speaker, Professor Dame Lynn Brindley, who is a member of the AHRC Council, and previously, as most of you know, Chief Executive of the British Library. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure and an honor to have been asked to speak at this important conference today. Um, I'm not intending to use any PowerPoints. I thought you might have enough of those later. Uh, but I do want to uh, just uh, speak um, from notes. Um, my first point is to congratulate um, Janet Finch and her working group on the, what I think is a tour de force, which is the report, uh, all 150 plus pages of it. In particular, I think it's no mean feat to have got such a distinguished group together, all with very strong and divergent views, and kept the group together through thick and thin to produce such a powerful report and set of recommendations in which there appear to be no single winners. Everyone has challenges to face, changes to make, and new possibilities and risks are there uh, in spades. Uh, no player, publisher, library, academic researcher, university or funder is excluded or left untouched. The brief uh, that the Finch Group had was to ensure sustainability through a long or very long transition, not for the group an option to lead a revolution, to overturn a complex but known scholarly communications ecology, even if the group had wanted to but to nudge forward what would seem to be inexorable progress towards the goal of open access, of publicly funded research being freely accessible to all across the globe. Judging too by the enormous level of blogging, uh, the media debate, expressions of support and opposition, uh, the report has already achieved a raising of consciousness and interest in a complex and to many before this report, an esoteric area, which frankly no one else had managed to raise that level of interest and flurry of activity. Um, uh, for example, in publishers um, launching OA journals or OA routes to journals, um, which has simply accelerated. Uh, having been around for rather a long time, uh, this is progress that was not achieved um, if, uh, in, in the last 25 years. We should make mista no mistake, therefore, that this is a seminal report and it requires serious attention and ownership of the issues. And I congratulate the um, society uh, and the attendees here um, for putting on this conference um, and having recognized this and being prepared to spend precious time in its consideration. 
But be warned, I think, that whilst the principles are elegantly simple, the path to implementation is complex, contestable, already contested, and the detail really does matter. So what's my brief in kicking off this two-day conference with its focus on particularly what does Finch mean for the humanities and social science? Well, I've been asked to keep my re re remarks to quite a high level. There's plenty of opportunity for debate and disagreement later in the programme. I'm going to try and set the scene, position pin uh, Finch in a bit of context, and pull out some of the key issues and challenges that have struck me on reading the report and associated commentary. Other speakers are going to go into more detail from their perspectives as key players in this uh, complicated communications ecology. As the report says, and I quote, the principle that the results of research that have been publicly funded should be freely accessible in the public domain is a compelling one and fundamentally unans unanswerable. This principle seems to me to be one that cannot and should not be gainsaid, but the complexities of the now and the how of the transition to a more open future in a way which does not implode the system or indeed have unintended consequences is a pretty difficult challenge. Additional arguments used in favour of more open access include the fact that the more open the access, the faster the research dissemination and therefore research progress, productivity and knowledge transfer. Widespread global access, and of course the system is international, with the UK being only a small but influential player, given that we punch well above our weight both in research outputs and in the strength of our publishing industry means that with the creation of a more level playing field for access, the dependency, for example, on whether any library can afford to subscribe to a particular journal, or whether a researcher or member of the public has personal means of access to research findings, goes away. Less ideologically, some argue, frankly, that it's simply the exponential price rises in STEM journals, science, technology, engineering, and medicine journals, that have essentially made the status quo ante quite untenable. The Finch report, of course, does not sit in isolation. There are at least six recently published, relevant, and linked reports that are part of the growing traction of open access. The Finch report itself. There are several reports and recommendations coming out of the European Commission, uh, particularly through Neela Crowes, Vice President of the Commission, responsible for the digital agenda and a strong advocate for making open access a reality for publishing research results and associated data. All research, for example, under Horizon 2020 will be mandated to be open access, whether by green or gold routes with an apparent preference for the green route. And I'll return to the differences between green and gold as Finch comes out strongly, as those of you who've read the full report will know, in favor of the gold route. <coughs> the third report, which is significant, is the Hargreaves Review of Intellectual Property and Copyright, recommendations from which have been responded to by government and which are moving through various legislative routes towards implementation well, at least of the few contentious parts of the review. Others are, I think, being uh, seriously contested and fought. The fourth report, which I think for this community is the most serious adjunct to the Finch report, is, of course, the Royal Society report on science as an open enterprise with a focus on data. And because of that report, whilst Finch touches on data and says some important things, it's nonetheless not the core of the Finch report, but it is really the core um, from the Royal Society and important, of course, to this community. The fifth one, um, contextual, is the amendments to the European Commission's public sector information directive. Again, setting a climate for more transparency and more openness 
of information and data, particularly that funded um, and, if you like, owned in the public, um, public, center enter public sector enterprises. And the final one to mention is the UK government's Open Data White Paper, which recommended a research transparency sector board to lead and take forward issues of access to research data. With all this direct and related interest, the tide towards making content and data of all types open, accessible and reusable with the minimum of fuss and conditions set are all part and parcel of building a transparency and innovation agenda which touches the academy but has much wider ramifications and significant, uh, particularly for societal and economic benefit for research, innovation and commercial exploitation. Now, in essence, the research uh, endorses moves towards more open publishing, particularly a policy direction in the UK for gold open access, where publishers essentially receive their money up front from authors or proxies for authors uh, rather than readers. So research articles become freely accessible to everyone immediately upon publication with a minimum of conditions attached. Now, I was advised to digress a bit into just explaining a little bit more about, you know, the permutations of gold and green. Would that be valuable to some of this audience, or are you all so knowledgeable? Oh, I'm seeing some nods. Okay, so forgive me, some of you, perhaps I'm teaching granny to suck eggs, but it just does bear repeating, I think, a bit. So gold, you know, the gold standard, uh, is where publishers receive the revenues from authors rather than those who read the, the article. So that research articles are then freely accessible upon publication. The author, by which read mostly the institution, the research council, the Wellcome Trust, or a and other, pays. <coughs> And the terms and conditions around reuse are minimal. And in the Finch report, it's about attribution only. In other words, a respect for uh, intellectual ownership. But for many advocates of open, the green open access route is the only true route. And there are many, believe me, many very articulate true believers. And, you know, that, that is where we get into... Uh, very significant, a good deal of heat and very little light when we get those um, uh, far ends of the spectrum together. The green route in the report is where articles in post-print versions are made available in an institutional or a subject repository, subject only to specified embargo periods, depending on publisher and research funder policy. There is already vociferous disappointment in some quarters that not more attention and support has been given for green open access based on subject uh, and institutional repositories with no embargo attached, i.e. the pure or radical, most radical position, depending on your point of view. This leads to a second key concept if you want to understand Finch which is the article processing or publishing charges, APCs, um, associated with gold open access. In other words, the costs and profits associated with publication are shifted away from subscriptions, from reader pays, upstream to authors and funding bodies of various kinds, whether via institutions or research councils for th through their research grants, uh, or publication grants. Now, if that isn't complicated enough, there's another factor which enters the, the, the frame, which is that gold and APCs, in the, in the case of Finch and its implementation, sit alongside research councils and RCUK new open access policies and mandates, specifying conditions attaching to research that is funded by research councils. 
Research funders, of course, are equally interested in ensuring, ensuring wide accessibility of research findings with as few restrictions as possible, and also significantly have an interest in bearing down on costs associated with publication. It's anticipated that the ground rules for publication after the current REF, uh, this would be for whatever REF 2020 is called and however it um, transforms itself, will reflect this shift and in themselves will be a powerful catalyst for future change. But of course we still have to wait for those new guidelines. It's really important to become familiar with the overall RCUK policy on open access, which essentially from 1st of April 2013, uh, peer-reviewed um, uh, papers, research papers, which result from research that is wholly or partially funded by the research councils, must be published in journals which are compliant with the RC policy on open access and must include details of that funding that supported the research and a statement on how the underlying research materials such as data, samples and models can be accessed. The policy recommends an APC model accompanied by the mandated use of Created Commons um, Attribution License, CCBY for those in the know, uh, when an APC is levied, which allows others to modify, build upon and or distribute the licensed work, including for commercial purposes, as long as the original author or authors are credited. If a pay-to-publish model is not used, then a deposit in a subject or institutional repository after a mandated maximum embargo period is the alternative. The embargo period is six months by default for research councils and the Wellcome Trust, with the ESRC and the AHRC being exempt from the six-month rule, which for these disciplines will be extended to 12 months in the first instance. Uh, this is to give time to adjust. So those of you who are nervous that this is running very fast and faster than many of you feel you can cope with, um, you have 12 months instead of six months as embargo, at least for the time being. It's argued um, that because humanities and social science journals are often smaller, than physical science publications and so less prepared for open access changes. Although, frankly, I have to say most of the publishers here at this conference and sponsoring it are well at the forefront of both understanding and opening up opportunities in open publishing. There are many sub-complexities of all of this which I'll spare you, but frankly it made, makes Fifty Shades of Grey look simple by comparison. Uh, but it looks as though gold green embargo periods and APCs are here to stay and these are core concepts for everyone to understand. Now the question is what on earth has it got to do with humanities and social science for disciplines and sub-disciplines which range from theology to economics? I think one deep concern is that the frame of reference for the Finch report is essentially that of STM publishing. You all have to be vigilant not to be passively swept along in what might be the wrong game as one size clearly does not fit all. It's undoubtedly true and recognized explicitly in the Finch report that the focus is primarily on journal articles since, I quote, they constitute in volume and importance the major published outputs for researchers in the great majority of disciplines. In the scoping chapter, there's recognition that monographs and edited collections of essays are, of course, particularly important in the humanities and some areas of social sciences, but they don't really significantly feature at all as key output, out, um, outputs of research in the life and physical sciences. It's suggested that moves towards open access publishing and digital publishing generally have been much slower here than with journal articles. And experimentation is much at a much earlier stage. That's with books and so on. And I think this is evidentially the case. 
there is reference in the report to what I call that wonderful, ca wonderful category of material of grey literature. Uh, that range of documents from conference proceedings through formal and policy reports, pamphlets, working papers and other ephemera that always seem difficult to catalogue, difficult to find, impossible to organise and I may say are now even more transitory through their often temporary appearance on a website with no hard copy, often hidden uh, within badly designed websites and cumbersome interfaces. This separate category of publications does not fit the model either, but it remains a very important uh, genre or collection of genres in some of the social sciences and humanities. The report also recognizes the significance of and the demise of the research monograph in our disciplines, and it recognizes the long-term decline of library book budgets, a situation exacerbated by the exponential rise in the cost of STEM journal subscriptions, those particularly emanating from the major commercial publishers such as Wiley and Elsevier, Springer and so on. The percentage spent by libraries on monographs compared with journal deals is somewhere around 30-70% ratio uh, at best. Indeed, the research monograph could be argued to be in terminal crisis, and certainly smaller university presses, traditional supporters of book publishing, are struggling. The brief coverage and conclusion on books, therefore, is that relatively few research monographs are yet available online, and there's been little progress towards open access book publishing. Even the pilots and experiments are in very early stages. I think just to note, particularly the European-funded um, OA Pen project, which seeks to pilot a model for academic books um, in the digital um, world, and also interestingly, but that's a three-year research project, um, but uh, uh, interestingly, for example, a new model coming out of Francis Pinter, ex-Bloomsbury um, and Pinter Publishing, uh, uh, called something like um, Knowledge Unla Unlatched, and this is a library consortial first copy production cost model where publishers are paid a title fee from libraries. In return, the publisher produces OA monographs. So very early stages, and I'm sure there'll be a lot more experimentation. Uh, I think the point, absent Finch, if you like, is that we all in the academic community need to be thinking very creatively and imaginatively about what new opportunities there are in the digital world for new forms of scholarly communication uh, well beyond the journal. But the deliberate focus on STEM, as I said earlier, doesn't mean um, that the humanities and social sciences can sit back and ignore Finch. Obviously, as I said, many of you publish in journals and also heavily rely on database methods. So this, there is a core interest in the shift. Secondly, given that the change and change in policy is implied for all actors in the scholarly communication, um, including uh, AHRC and ESRC, it's fundamentally important that the voice of the Academy of Researchers in our disciplines is represented cogently and po positively in shaping the next stages of the debate and in the steps to implementation. Uh, the third point there, I think, is that research monographs must be included in the wider debate, as must be the future of the peer review process for such outputs. So let me now turn to what I see as some of the key challenges and indeed the questions of transition and implementation. And I've got several of these challenges. So the first one is what's called the Institutional Publication Fund. I've talked about APCs, Article Processing Publishing Charges, now, the research councils propose to channel funding for APCs through institutions, mostly universities, with a recommendation that these funds should be earmarked in an institutional publication fund. Um, look carefully at the way in which the £10 million windfall announced by David Willits has been distributed. 
it's to kickstart, and that's probably an apt phrase, um, the 30 most, um, most research-intensive higher education institutions to take the first essential steps towards fully open access publication based on gold and APCs. Uh, Kickstart, I think, is apt because, not least, uh, because it's recognised that annual costs to research-intensive universities are likely to far exceed this one-off amount. And indeed, in the past couple of weeks, the research councils have announced their block grant approach to support open access publishing, indicative for the next five years. There's already, of course, significant criticism of this, some, for example, query the logic of the Research Council allocation method. This is the indicative five-year method, which is proposed to be proportional to how much the institution has charged research councils in direct labour costs over the past three years. While well, some argue, not unreasonably, I think, that this penalises highly productive areas and low-cost disciplines. And I know already that dissatisfaction is growing strongly with this approach. As researchers and academics, it would seem to me critical that you all engage with these mechanisms and processes that institutions, your universities, put in place uh, to administer the Institutional Publication Fund, not least to ensure that the needs of the humanities and social science researchers are taken into full consideration. Now, I have a long list of questions. Some of these duplicate um, in, the, in the, uh, the Finch report, and Janet has rightly said that some are, there are some putative answers in the report. But let me just give you a sample of my queries. How is the mechanism for allocation, how is it going to work within an institutional environment, within an individual university? Will the funding be rationed? In which case, who is going to play Big Brother? Who is going to decide between... Um, what gets published or what goes for gold and what is left for green because gold can't be afforded. What will the relationship be between individual researchers and the university? I mean, to be provocative, uh, one might argue that there's more trust between an individual publisher and her, research and, the, and her publisher and the researcher than between the researcher and her university acting as a gatekeeper. And, uh, and, and I, I can see that I've provoked some of you in that comment. But uh, is, who is going to do it? Is this a job for the research office? Uh, how transparent is the process going to be? You know, and then we have questions of academic freedom and freedom of choice. How can the risks of distortion in allocations be avoided? What happens, actually, if the best journal for you is a non-UK one? Um, what happens in multi-authored papers where most of your co-authors are non-UK people? Um, it's the prerogative of the first speaker, of course, to ask the questions. What happens when the demand for APCs outstrips funds? Uh, will the library be budge budget be raided to pay for high-priced APCs? And there is an enormous variety in the cost uh, being or the charge for one APC, ranging roughly from £500 to £5,000, even £8,000 in some journals for one article. How are early stage researchers going to be protected and enabled to publish? How will retired academics, often the most productive because they have no more admin to do, be protected and be enabled to publish? Um, and what about independent scholars? What about those non-affiliated scholars? And what about all that material that's part of journal publishing, which doesn't attract page charges? How is that going to be paid for? Book reviews, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I could go on and on and on, but you know, I think you get the flavor that in many ways there are many questions that have got to be sensitively addressed before, if this is going to be ma made to work. Um, certainly sitting on a research council, I mean, one of the overriding concerns, too, is, frankly, there isn't enough money to go around for the research, let alone to have to pay for this. And, you know, there is an overriding concern that, of course, um, you know, alpha research pro proposals shouldn't be turned down. Or, uh, and, and so stretching the, the finite pot is, is, is difficult. 
Now, I'm not going to go into the overall economics behind the move to open. There's an awful lot of it in the report, and much of it is speculative. But it's clear that libraries, research councils, bodies negotiating the big deals, and researchers themselves will need to demand much more transparency about APCs and the costs, publisher costs, profits, and value to ensure a continuing challenge to the APC charges. Uh, and as Finch hopes, I quote, to grind down on excessive charges. Remains to be seen how easy this will be, because as all of us know, the journal market is, to say the least, an imperfect market, given lack of direct substitutional value of journals, one with another, and the critical importance researchers, the REF, and others place on quality and impact. Much, I think, will depend on how long the tr transition lasts and whether un other countries follow suit in their mandates. And I've thrown away those re uh, remarks quickly, but those are pretty fundamental issues. Second challenge, it brings me to learned societies. Finch report is explicit in its concern about the future of learned societies, their continuing survival and health, recognizing the important wider role that they play in academic engagement. Uh, the traditional models um, of learned societies, many in which case, many in, in, in many cases responsible for only a single journal, um, has been that any surplus on journal publishing contributes towards a range of scholarly activities. And if the subscription model goes, what happens to the rest of the valuable and valid activities of the societies. Now, frankly, this isn't a new issue. It's been around in the traditional print world for 20, 25 years. But I think Finch is bringing it back, if you like, as an issue with a vengeance. Um, I suspect most of you in this audience have particular affiliations to learned societies. And I think you really do need to engage and work through with the learned societies the adjustments to the business models and publishing in an open world. I think one of the pleas with which I have some sympathy is that adequate time is allowed for to make those adjustments to avoid uh, what the report, Janet Finch's report set out to do was to avoid unintended negative consequences and I think undue haste might uh, uh, prejudice that. The third area I've just labelled the big commercial publishers. And I'm going to mention only in passing because they're big and perfectly capable of looking after themselves, in, particularly in the STM world. Um, and they do defend themselves rightly and the profits they make for their shareholders and indeed the levels of innovation that they spearhead. There are many critics in academia who feel that the Finch report hands these major publishers complete victory on a plate uh, without challenging profit, lack of transparency, and their extremely expensive APC charge. That's an argument on one side. Uh, to be handed, if you like, your, your income up front without having to, crudely put, bother to market and not dependent on your level of sales um, understandably seems to many to be a defeat for the true advocates at the other end of fully green open access whereby technology in utopia would bypass publishers completely. However, frankly, we need to recognize many things about commercial publishers and major publishers. Firstly, that they already open, uh, offer open access options and that their continuing investment in service innovation is impressive. And they continue to engage in big deal and license negotiations which have benefited extraordinarily the academic access to journals. I only want wish, therefore, you know, there is a balanced view to be taken is what I'm saying there. And I would only wish today to just draw attention to one challenge, which is called colloquially double dipping, the situation of hybrid journals, because I said there were many permutations of gold and green. So there's this hybrid journal, 
um, whereby the funding comes from both subscription and from page charges because you have an option. So in theory, and we hope in practice, subscription payments ought to go down significantly as APC submissions increase. And clearly we need a good deal of transparency to ensure that that actually happens and that there is not this double dipping and that we don't pay twice uh, for things. To be fair to publishers though, I've already seen their websites in which they declare the number of open access articles in each of their journals. And at the moment, in many of these hybrid um, journals, it's a very low number of APC charges. So it is not going to suddenly mean that subscription charges uh, go down significantly. The fourth challenge, let me raise, you'd expect me to raise, is that for libraries. And I just want to touch, reflect briefly there are both opportunities and threats, I think, and the voice of humanities and social science scholars, many of whom rely not just on e-access, but also on more traditional library resources, that you need to be engaged in that discussion and as heard as part of competing voices for library and information resources. Academic libraries have long played a role in license negotiations and the development of the big deal working with JISC and other agents. And in some institutions, libraries are keepers of the institutional repositories, supporting, for example, preparations for REF 14. There are, I think, some questions to be asked about how sustainable IRs will be in the new environment and what exactly their role should be beyond stewardship of an institution's outputs and providing a show window for them. Potential opportunities include the development of services to support the university publication fund process on the status of journals, impact factors, charge sheets, comparing APCs from different publishers, and generally supporting academics and the research office in monitoring, intelligent gathering, and managing this complex future. Dangers, I think, include the obvious source of, that they're the obvious source of funds uh, because of the acquisitions and content licensing budgets, which universities might see as an obvious place to raid to pay for APCs on an assumption, misguided, I believe, in the short term, certainly, that deals and subscription costs will drop significantly. Certainly, I would hope that social science and humanities researchers and scholars will have a particular role in that set of arguments to ensure that their needs beyond the journal can be catered for and sustained. Another factor, I think, and I don't think anybody has really thought that yet through how this mishmash of materials will be easily discoverable. Now, how are you going to know with a hybrid journal, what conditions apply to what article, what embargo period pertains, and what the copyright conditions are when you come to want to reuse it. We may be heading towards metadata confusion, and don't libraries love met metadata, but I'm, this is a rather a serious issue, I think, and it's certainly not clear that we've got the agreed apparatus or yet the standards to fully describe the status of each journal and its access conditions, nor agreed role or appropriate roles or appropriate leadership to deal with it together. A final point on libraries, and it's a little gem, I think, in the Finch report. I'm delighted that there is agreement with publishers that walk-in users of public libraries across the UK will have access to the great majority of journals and articles available in the UK at no additional cost to the system. This will enhance their service offering and more importantly, give citizens <coughs> rightful, free and ready access to the fruits of research that their taxes have funded. Supporting the intellectually curious and the citizen scholars and experts who are unattached to universities and research institutions. My fifth challenge is data. Now the complex issues of data, as I said earlier, have really been addressed. Uh, in the Royal Society report and are therefore not centrally addressed in Finch. However, there's a strong thrust with gold open access to ensure that data 
as well as the journal article, is made freely available for reuse and further manipulation in a variety of settings, and that repurposing of data is enabled with the minimum of conditions imposed. That is the fundamental importance of a CCBY license. However, what's less clear to me from Finch is a position on things like text mining, which in the context of another significant report, the Hargreaves report, which was on modernization of the copyright regime, has met with resistance, very, very uh, significant resistance from publishers in attempts to open up journal and book texts for large-scale analysis and manipulation using new research methods and techniques. Now, whatever is the case, it's clearly going to be important for this community of scholars here to engage very actively with the data aspects of open access, given particularly the enormous experience of social scientists with data curation and its challenges, and the enormous potential for all our disciplines for future text and data mining opportunities. This is not an opportunity to be left to just the Royal Society and big science. <coughs> and my final um, challenge and comments pertain to the implementation word, or should I say rather lack of the word in the report. Um, that to me is rather disappointing. There is no implementation plan or even a roadmap for the next steps. Um, I think very disappointing particularly because of the impetus that the report has given to making progress and indeed the government's intervention with its Seacorn funding. That the ecology is complex and getting even more so, I hope is self-evident from my, uh, this initial overview. Um, so many stakeholders and players need to be part of the implementation. It does mean that an implementation plan unless we simply want the report to go into a black hole or perhaps more likely to have a fragmented range of uncoordinated initiatives. Uh, it's, so an implementation plan is quite essential. I think there, there is something for all parties to perhaps urge uh, that the Research Info Net Information Network, which so, in my view, brilliantly coordinated and drafted the report, um, to uh, be enabled to take on a coordination role uh, in getting the roadmap, um, which I think as an aside should also include a more extended period for awareness raising and consultation. Not that I want to stop implementation going quickly. I've waited 25 years, you know, with very little progress. Um, but to ensure that everybody understands and has all the mechanisms ready to go. So, just to finish, I've skimmed the surface of the issues, forgive me. Um, there are many issues and more issues for debate, but I hope I've just given you some food for thought and some um, deeper uh, opportunity to get deeper understanding of the significance of the report, not least for this community. Uh, and I'm sure and hope that the rest of the discussion in the two days is going to pick this up in a great deal more detail. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Um, I'm Terrell Carver from the University of um, Bristol Politics. And uh, I'm on the um, executive of the Political Studies Association UK and also the International Political Science Association. Um, thank you very much for the appropriately critical overview. Could I just ask for more clarification and information really about something that I think you said, but I may not quite have heard, which was that um, reflecting the apparent starting point for this debate, I think you said that the um, commercial arrangements among large publishers were less than perfect market or were imperfect in some way. I'm, I'm actually quite puzzled uh, by all of that because my experience with journals in um, various roles is that it actually functions pretty well in that the major publishers 
uh, compete with each other. There's been a vast proliferation of journals uh, from different publishers. There are new publishers in the market. Um, if they are a cartel and price fixing, they should be prosecuted. Um, if they're not, I see a lot of evidence of uh, competition in a market working uh, in a reasonable way. My suspicion is that perhaps there are some disciplines in the sciences that operate with uh, fixed formal or informal lists of journals that are ranked. And that is in effect handing publishers who may own the journals or learned societies who don't put them out to tender um, a kind of instant monopoly. But it doesn't have to be like that. I mean, what really puzzles me is if Elsevier charges too much, um, why um, libraries and institutions don't just stop subscribing and let somebody else in the market and set up another journal? I mean, is, is there an answer to that? <laughs> well, the answer is in people like yours hands, frankly, who, uh, who publish, um, ultimately. And uh, I mean, if this report at minimum achieves a greater awareness of um, comparative value, which might weigh up cost against, um, uh, you know, quality, um, against other factors which have, I mean, do play significantly, uh, things like impact factors and, 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 you know, peer judgments, editorial boards, et cetera, et cetera then that will have done something. My reference to imperfect market was um, somebody here, David, you may know, but I mean, many, significant number of years ago now, the whole, this is particularly STM market, was referred, I think, to the OFT, wasn't it, as a, uh, oh, you're looking back, anyway, I, I think it was. And I mean, in economic terms, I think it is an imperfect market because because of the arguments that there is no absolute substitution uh, one to another. Now, I think you're arguing that maybe, um, maybe they're increasing the ears. Um, and, and I think, so, so that's a sort of, um, you know, it was a question, uh, really, uh, which says there is a perception that it's an imperfect. And it's driven largely, I have to say, by the, 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 the status and, the, and where academics wish to publish and quality. Now, those are issues arguably in your own hands. Um, but you know, then you get into questions of tenure tracks and what proxies and how do you measure, et cetera, et cetera. And there is, you know, there is clearly a view in most disciplines at this point that to go at the, you know, at the very radical end, uh, just, you know, just put it up. Uh, on, a, on a subject um, repository or an institutional repository is second, third rate thing to do. But I do, I do think the challenge is, you know, the challenge is driven a lot from the paradigm of the STM model. And, and I think it is genuinely over to you. And clearly, the, 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 the REF 2020, I mean, the, you know, what the criteria will be and what will be acceptable ways and places to publish in will be absolutely critical because no doubt what you're working on now will be outputs um, at that period. Um, thanks very much. My name is uh, Mira Sabaratnam. Hi. Hi. My name is Mira Sabaratnam. I am a very young academic. I'm in my first lecturing job at the University of Cambridge. Uh, I have a series of concerns. I want to just pick up two uh, which you touched on in the, in the speech. Um, the first is the difference 
about green and gold. If green is going to be a path which is good enough to meet open access criteria, isn't gold simply a waste of money? Right? Green will have to be acceptable for all of that research which doesn't have the money to pay the APCs. Lots of my colleagues in uh, universities with less money have annual research budgets of less than the lowest APC charge which we have. Right? So that will eat the entire budget. Um, so they'll be required to go green. But if green is accepted as a public standard of good enough open access, why should any of us pay APCs? That's the first issue. The second one is on academic freedom. In the case of institutional publication funds, um, this seems to violate the principle that expert peer review is the way by which academic research is judged, because the people in those funds will be structurally, by definition, not able to give expert peer review to work which is being put forward for publication. Um, so I think this is going to be a very serious impact on academic freedom, um, particularly if APCs are the first port of call rather than something which is required. I actually understand the government wanting this for sciences and medicine and technologies because they want companies to be able to mine that data, and that was the trade-off they gave with the Treasury. But that's not appropriate for our disciplines, and I think it's really very dangerous. Well, I, th I think you... I mean, I'm not going to answer that question because it's not my place to answer it. And you have, if you like, given the two extremes. What I've hoped that I perhaps indicated is that, you know, there is a, there is a spectrum. Um, and uh, I think what you do will be uh, partly dependent on, on the attitude your, your institution takes and the, uh, 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 to, to some of these things. Now, it does then raise questions about the mechanisms through which publication is funded via your university. And that's why I'm arguing to you that, at minimum, you absolutely must ensure that the voice of social science and humanities is heard in that, um, in that area. But, I mean, the publishers are keeping very quiet, and it seems to me, uh, you know, that, that there is an issue there for publishers. Uh. Um, there, there are an array of hands that have uh, gone up. I'm conscious of the time. It is 11.30, but I, my sense is such as the interest. Um, with your permission, could we continue for about another 10 minutes or so? Would that be the mood of the meeting? Good. Okay. Um, Helen. Um, Helen Perkins, uh, Chief Executive and Director of the Society for Research in Higher Education. Um, thank you very much for, for covering a lot of points. There were two in particular that I would really appreciate um, some perspective um, further from you. Um, before I do that, I would like to endorse the point that was made originally about um, what constitutes partial funding, because it is a very big issue in a lot of the social sciences. I mean, not least over the last five to seven years, the ESRC has highly encouraged us to um, mine existing data sets, for example, um, and a vast amount of work has been done on that, which means that we have a lot of articles in the pipeline which are, are using old, you know, essentially old, old data. I mean, our view is that this cannot be retrospectively and that um, it applies after 2013, and as yet we haven't had... Um, you know, any, we haven't had any response from the, the council on that, but it is a, it is a, it is a big issue, and, and certainly for a lot of authors um, who, are, who are facing issues of that sort of complexity. Um, the first thing I wanted to ask you about is actually about licensing, because I think in common with a lot of other learned societies, and we are very perplexed by the um, sort of RCUK um, research councils um, taking the view that uh, BYCC license um, is perfectly acceptable. I mean, our view is, as learning societies is that um, this provides very, very little protection for authors. And I'm also um, totally perplexed as to why, with so much potential commercial exploitation down the line, not least in all the um, international uh, digital and other learning uh, possibilities that we are essentially, I mean, giving open access is one thing, handing um, our research over for others to exploit for commercial use seems to me really quite extraordinary and I, I don't understand why we haven't those restrictions. So, and, and my final point is just about the, le the learned societies because 
you know, you've, you've um, said some, some very valuable things about timescales and roadmaps and, and, and taking a, uh, a slower approach to this. But in many ways, the learning societies have had this taken out of our hands because the, the RCUK has decided on certain things and other things come over the hill. It's, and we have had a great deal of the power in our relationships with publishers taken away um, in the advent of the Finch report. We used to be able to control, for example, the subscription level for, for HEIs. We no longer have that power. Um, so anything you can say that will help us uh, work on that transition process and how we can um, influence that would be very valuable. Yes, in many ways, I think I take what you say as a, as a very intelligent comment, which is taking the debate um, forward, and it's certainly probably not for me, um, particularly at this point, to answer them. But I think all the points so far, I think, and I'm, I'm delighted to see um, Dame Janet has arrived. Um, and she's a much more expert in all of this than me. Um, but uh, I think that the, the, there are several messages coming out. One is the, um, you know, we need to be very careful as a community that the one size model doesn't fit all and that we are, it is, it can be nuanced in ways that promote your disciplines. And I think some of those arguments must be then pursued, particularly with the research councils, the individual research councils, um, as they reflect and move forward. I mean, the RCUK statements that no doubt have been perhaps the most controversial and, and are being, I think, fairly heavily contested. Um, so, so I think you know, that's one. And I think then the other is um, to ensure in a sensible roadmap or implementation plan that we balance both uh, I think the, the the speed and the momentum which Janet's report has, you know, fantastically given this topic, uh, you know, which for probably 20 years hasn't had any traction at all. It was just seen something you shoved to the libraries to think about. You know, it was not treated as a, as actually core to the future nature of the scholarly communication process. That we both balance that momentum against simply giving enough appropriate time to ensure everybody is aware and um, actually deviling the detail of the implementation um, in ways in which we don't um, uh, you know, trip up um, with the wrong kind of consequence. So I, I, would, you know, I think those are two very powerful uh, messages, but I think the nervousness about doing that and taking time will be, you know, the long grass word, and not least because quite a lot of the impetus from this is, has, not, you know, has got quite political, um, uh, you know, push from from quite a high level, and it is as I tried to show you, um, part and parcel, although central to us, but one part of a broader. Um, open innovation, growth agenda, if you like, you know, a sort of government type of agenda. Nick Rushby, I'm the editor of the British Journal of Educational Technology. And understandably, we're, we're a fairly parochial lot in, in here. I mean, it's, uh, although I noted with, with pleasure that we uh, do have uh, somebody from uh, the American Educational Research Association here, which is great. Um, Although it's the British Journal of Educational Technology, um, only 14% of submissions come from the UK. Um, that's submissions over the last eight years. Um, and probably readership, percentage-wise, is even less. Um, and one of the problems, I think, is that in the report, um, there's been an assumption that um, the UK is somehow or other leading the way, not perhaps by very much, but a bit. Um, and I, I was trying to find you know, the evidence on which this was based, at any rate, um, for non-STEM subjects. We took the liberty of surveying readers. And certainly amongst the, um, the people who responded to that survey, um, it would appear that, that the UK is, in educational technology at least, 
um, lagging behind the rest of the world in terms of um, open access and preparedness and so on and so forth. I think there is a problem that um, a lot of what, certainly my interpretation of what I read in the report, is that it's based on people's best guesses um, and their opinions. Um, and they're probably quite good opinions because there were some very clever people on that, uh, on that committee. But I couldn't find an awful lot of hard evidence there as to how people, how authors will behave um, under certain circumstances. Mathematical modeling of academic journals indicates that perhaps some of those assumptions are flawed, particularly when it comes to quality issues. I'm not sure that there's an answer to that. I'm not sort of saying, you know, please could you tell me I'm wrong or whatever. But I do think it's an area where before we make any hard and fast decisions, we do need to do a little bit of, of evidence gathering on which to base our decisions as opposed to the rather common uh, decision-based ev evidence gathering, uh, sorry, decision-based evidence making, um, which is sometimes prevalent in the area. I'm, I'm taking that as a comment, I think, uh, as input to the discussion. We have, uh, we're already running considerably over time, um, and uh, in terms of the program and in fairness to the remaining uh, speakers today, um, I think I will um, just ask for one final question, and could it be succinct and crisp and brief, please? I think coffee calls for everyone. I will attempt to be crisp and brief. Um, you've said a number of times about making ourselves heard to avoid the sweeping along or the one-size-fits-all. Could you make some suggestions about to whom we can address some of these comments and how we might ensure that we're heard? Well, I think I've suggested various, <clears throat> um, uh, various um, levels, if you like, at which you need to uh, engage. And, and you know, one very important one is within your own institution, so that as these mechanisms emerge, um, the right questions are asked, and in, you know, and and you and the particular considerations of social science are taken on board. So that's the most obvious one, I think. Um, the second is many of you will be um, will, will clearly have associations with learned societies, and I think that's quite an important. You know, that's another dimension. Um, some of you will be on research councils. Anybody here on a research council? Yeah, so, you know, that, I mean, they, they are critical in terms of uh, perhaps um, nuancing of policy, particularly um, uh, HRC and ESRC, or indeed the subcommittees. And I guess also those of you who are doing um, uh, ref panels, or indeed are being, con you know, whatever the mechanism will be that's used for defining. Um, the REF 2020 um, rules of the game. You know, many of you are influential people, and of course through um, uh, through the ACSS as well. So I think there are many routes. I think the difficulty will be how do you get critical mass of of, of articulation, and that's why today I think is so important. Yeah. Can I ask you all to thank uh, Dame Lynn again, please?